couple really big AI news happening. First and foremost, Google can't stop winning. Some analysts believe it's going to 400. In other news, Grok 4.20 is coming in three or four weeks, as in we'll have it before the end of the year. Why is this important? Well, I'm sure you've seen the Alpha Arena and Grok 4.20 absolutely dominating the competition and making some money in one of the variations of the situational awareness where each model is aware of the fact that it's in competition with other AI models and they all get to see each other's profit and loss statements. Grok 420, I'm just going to start calling it Grok 420 because why not? Grok 420 is up almost 65% and that's just in a little bit over two weeks. So the competition began November 19th and then it ran for two weeks until December 3rd. I believe they call it December 3rd at 5 p.m. Eastern. And that's when the competition officially ended, but they just let the models keep running and making or losing money. So it's been two weeks plus four days, and this model is up to $16,454. So it started out with $10,000, and it's up to $16,000 plus. And if we combine all four variations that it's running, it's still up 22%. It's the only model that is you know, profitable, that has a positive ROI. So Grok 420 is coming out in three or four weeks. The mystery model that won the Alpha Arena was announced to be by Elon Musk to be an experimental version of Grok 4.20. And of course, Elon Musk revealed this to the world on December 4th in a response to one of my posts. I will never get over that. And if you recall that OpenAI went code red in response to Gemini 3.0 coming out and being just really good across the board. Well, it does seem like that code red did work. It seemed like they quickly galvanized and were able to quickly prepare a new model to get pushed out. This is a poly market, right? And the question is, which company has the best AI model end of 2025? I believe they're using LM Arena as a way to, to settle this bet. So a different way of asking the questions, by the end of 2025, which model, whose model is sitting at top of LM Arena? So currently, of course, as you might be aware, so Gemini 3 Pro is dominating across a lot of different categories. In fact, Google models in general are dominating across a lot of the categories. So here's Arena Overview. Gemini 3 Pro is very solid across the board. So it's number one overall, right? But it's number one in hard prompts, creative writing, instruction following. But we have a lot of competition. Grok 4.1 thinking, Claude Opus 4.5. Competition is very tight. GPT 5.1 high is in sixth place. So if this doesn't change at the end of the year, Google would win that bet. So here again is that chart. I cut the very last portion of it off just to create some suspense. The orange line noticed that's Google. So it was up at 91% at some point. People were like, Google's going to continue dominating throughout the end of the year. That's going to be the number one model at the end of 2025. Then OpenAI goes code red and on, let's see, what date was this? Somewhere around the very, very beginning of December, let's call it. The situation changes and OpenAI shoots up. So at the peak, it was a 26.6% chance, right? With Google dropping down to 66%. So what does that mean? That means that a lot of people are expecting OpenAI to make some big moves and basically climb back to the number one place in LM Arena. So what would you bet the outcome to be? So they're using the results from Arena score section of the leaderboard at lmarena.ai with the style control unchecked. Meanwhile, we've been seeing some new new models from OpenAI, what we believe to be OpenAI, that were tested in the arena. Emperor, Rockhopper, Mumble, and Macaroni. The different models have different reasoning budgets, so it's very possible that OpenAI is trying to find which model would get it to the top of that arena to, to beat Gemini 3.0. And of course, there's a lot of expense that goes into it. So, I mean, you can crank up the power, but it's going to be extremely expensive to run inference. So I think it's likely that they're going to try to find something that beats it, but they, they, they don't want to completely overshoot and spend a lot of money. They want to beat it by a solid lead, but not more than they have to. Meanwhile, Google recently published this paper, the two new papers actually, Titans plus Miras, 
helping AI have a long-term memory. We've talked about some of these papers before, nested learning, titans, etc. So the idea of, similar to how the human brain has long and short-term memory, this is a little bit similar to that. They're introducing different architectures that will try to mimic that to create more of a continuous learning approach. This is Ali Baruz. So he's one of the main authors behind a lot of that research. So he's talking about how they approached building these new architectures. And basically the big point with transformers, again, another Google uh, AI architecture back from 2017 that gets these models to understand what they should be paying attention to, what's important, what's not important, etc. The problem with transformers is the bigger the context window, the more expensive it is, the harder it is to kind of keep track of it all. It's quadratically more expensive. So if you think about it in terms of like how the human memory works, we have a short-term memory that is very accurate, but with a very limited window, like 30 seconds. How do we handle a longer context? Well, we kind of have other memory systems that help support that. So the idea is what do we put into long-term memory? How do we forget certain things? So over time, you might not need certain things, so you can kind of let those memories decay. Interestingly, surprise is yet another thing that is kind of taken into consideration here, right? So if you're surprised by something, you found something that's in didn't quite fit your world model. I'll give you an example. Have you tried things like vanilla ice cream or certain raspberry pastries or certain berry drinks where they say that, it's, that it has natural flavors on it? Now, natural flavoring might sound great, right? Delicious, natural. Here's the problem sometimes that natural flavoring, how they harvest it, and uh, you might be surprised by this. It comes from, from beavers, specifically from their like anal glands. So natural flavorings could mean delicious beaver butt juice. Did you know that? If not, you're probably pretty surprised. Also, honey is bees regurgitating stuff like they they, they have it digesting their stomachs and they, they throw it back up and that's honey. Now, if you didn't know this, you were probably surprised by it. What is a surprise? Sort of the delta. It's the difference between kind of what your world model was and this new information that you just learned. By the way, all of that is 100% true. You can just Google it. I made those images with Nano Banana Pro. It cited all the sources and everything. And that surprise, that difference between what you thought it was, which is delicious ice cream and honey, et cetera, and what it actually was, that, that difference, that surprise will likely mean that it'll take you a long time to forget it. You're welcome. So interestingly, with these AIs, with these neural net architectures, there's a lot of crossover. So notice how they're saying it's we're kind of using similar ideas that we notice exist in a sort of human brains, right? So crucially, Titans doesn't just passively store data. So it's not like this catalog or, or filing cabinet where we just throw all the data into. It actively learns how to recognize and retain important relationships and conceptual themes that connect tokens across the entire input. A key aspect of stability is what we call the surprise metric. In human psychology, we know we quickly and easily forget routine expected events, but remember things that break the pattern, unexpected, surprising, or highly emotional events. Like when I told you about the beavers and the bees, we skipped the short-term memory and logged it directly in your long-term memory. I am, I am sorry. But it was such a perfect way to explain it. I just, I, I couldn't help myself. And uh, finally, I just want to do a quick update. I'm not sure if it's a correction, but I might've stated some things not 100% clearly in my last video about TPUs. We actually interviewed somebody from Semi Analysis. Jeremy, it was an absolutely fantastic interview. I'm trying to publish it. Here's the problem. We interviewed him right before this paper was published. And this paper, I believe, was the first time that Google revealed the news. This is semi-analysis, but they were sort of basing it on based on some, some of the things that Google has revealed. One of the big reveals, as I'm sure you know, is that Google seems like it's beginning to sell TPUs, so their own AI chips. It's beginning to sell them to customers. As in, like, you can take the physical GPU, put it in your own metal rack on a data center and build your own data center. And one of my previous videos about it, so we posted the interview with Jeremy from Semi Analysis, where we actually were talking at length about what would happen if Google started to sell TPUs externally. You know, this would certainly be a big deal. It would make them a much bigger player. 
right now we're actually seeing that it might be beginning to happen. And I don't mean renting it out through the cloud, but actually selling actual physical metal TPUs that you can put in your own data center, build your data center with it. It sounds like that's happening in the Anthropic deal. It was a hybrid deal. So that million TPUs that are being sold to Anthropic, right? The first phase of the deal covers 400,000 the, of these TPU V7 Ironwoods that Broadcom will sell directly to Anthropic, right? Somebody else will handle the on-site setup, all that stuff. And the remaining 600,000 TPUs will be rented through GCP, Google Cloud. And they're in talks in potentially starting to sell GPUs. And they're in talks of selling, again, external TPUs, right? So externally selling it to other people starting with Anthropic and extending to Meta, SSI, XAI, and even potentially OpenAI. So as the article begins here in the very beginning, now Google is selling TPUs physically to multiple firms. So I just wanted to provide that clarification because we had that interview where we like went point by point and then like days later we had this breaking news and a lot of this is still sort of like projected in the future so there's no deals with all those companies SSI Meta I think XA Housing or maybe even OpenAI I don't think they have any deals signed or at least nothing announced but it does seem like there are talks about selling those TPUs to them which of course would be a, a huge deal it would have an impact on on Google on Nvidia on pretty much everybody else Meanwhile, Michael J. Burry is up to something. So there's Kakashi and him discussing this idea of NVIDIA's GPUs being warehoused in mass quantities in the U.S., but also overseas. I'll link some of this down below, but for the people that are playing the game of GPUs and are interested in all this stuff, whether you're investing or just out of curiosity, so I haven't had a chance to look at this yet. And this is not really in my wheelhouse because they're doing a lot of calculations about, you know, how many power generators you need, et cetera. But if you're interested in Michael J. Burry, the man from the big short, the one that shorted the housing bubble, whatever, 2008, 2009. So he, of course, does have a short against NVIDIA and a Palantir. And we're beginning to kind of see glimpses into why he's doing that. So you can kind of watch that developing. If that's something you're interested in, Andre Karpafi posted something talking about, you know, what happens when you refer to the model as you, as in, what do you think about this? Just notice that Elon Musk just commented on this. So this is probably going to blow up even more than it was. Technium from a news research replied, Eliezer Yukovsky, ironic given the conversation with Replicate last week. Replicate is Janus and they wrote simulators on less wrong. And that's quite a hefty, hefty blog post, article, whatever you want to call it. If you are interested in the whole idea of the psychology of LLMs, how they perceive things, how they think about things, this is kind of an interesting thing to dive into. We'll probably be doing another video about this because again, like this is just beginning to blow up. Maybe bookmark this because I, I, I do feel like it's going to be a big deal because you'll see that some people are going to disagree with this take. They're going to disagree with Andre's take. I also have a question in here, so maybe Andre will notice it. But I know for, for some, some of you, this is going to be an absolutely fascinating thing to pay attention to. It's just beginning to break, so keep an eye out. I think it has everything. It has a little bit of drama, mystique, you know, the craziness about how LLMs quote unquote think do they think do they perceive themselves as something and this is like those superhero movies where like all the different universes combine I, I mean you've got Elon Musk Andre you've got people from news research people from less wrong you got Eliza replicate like it's the veritable who's who of the AI world commenting and talking about this if this is of interest to you we did have an actual interview with a member of news research so this is it. So Karan 4D, co-founder and head of behavior at News Research. Like if you want to know about the insanity that goes on inside these LMs, this would be a great podcast to listen to. And yeah, just pay attention because I think things will be blowing up in that particular discussion. In other news, we already covered this before, but Elon Musk will be planning to put solar-powered AI data centers in space, similar to Google's 
Project Suncatcher. Meanwhile, Kathy Wood of ARK Invest open source her model for how they evaluate SpaceX. So in their bull case scenario, it's worth something like $3.1 trillion, I believe. So here's that. So kind of the expected value, $2.5 trillion, bull case, $3.1 trillion. So that's what they believe it's worth. Here's the thing. This is before the solar powered data centers in space idea. So Elon Musk jumps in here saying, hey, that's a big factor that we need that we need to consider. So we covered why it's such a big idea when we covered Project Suncatcher by Google. Basically, in a nutshell, Google tested out a lot of things and they were like, whoa, this is very viable. Putting AI data centers in a sun synchronous orbit is fairly viable in a lot of different ways. Lasers can transfer data between satellites. They just have to fly in a certain formation, but it's not that complicated to, to steer it. Solar panels are six times to 10 times more effective in space than they are on the surface of the planet. And all the equipment, including TPUs, don't get fried by the radiation. I forget the exact numbers, but it seems like they're more than enough for a five-year mission. Like they'll easily survive. The amount of radiation they soak up is far less than the point at which they start tripping out. Literally, there's only one thing that prevents us from doing it right now, kind of like the biggest obstacle. That is the price to shoot things up into orbit. It needs to come down the kilo per dollar price to put things into a low Earth orbit right now is too damn high. I think it's something like fifteen hundred dollars per kilo for for the specific stuff that they need to put up there. And we need it to be something like 200 in order for it to be equivalent to what it'll cost to build data centers and power plants here on earth but if we take a look at spacex and their learning rate their ability to keep improving and optimizing things and reducing the cost then if that learning rate is sustained then we'll hit what where we need to be like the 200 dollars per kilo we'll hit it by 2035 so not that far away here elon musk is saying it's going to be less than three years so if you're taking google they're saying it's about 10 years away elon musk is saying it's about three years away maybe it's somewhere in between maybe one is closer than the other we'll see the point is it's not 50 years away. It's not 100 years away. This might be the cheapest way for us to power AI data centers, again, by, by just putting them out in space in a not too distant future. It's easier to cool them in space. The dumping of the heat, like if we have all these centers all over Earth, you know, pumping heat into the atmosphere, eventually that becomes a problem. If they're out in space, it's not so much a problem. There's tons of free electricity there, right? Meaning that, you know, you just generate the sun's rays that are there 24 hours a day if you're in the right orbit. It's something like six to 10 times more efficient to collect sunlight for electricity there than it is here on the planet's surface. Like there's a lot of benefits. Anyways, we'll cover a lot more of this in a separate video. I am off. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth and I'll see you in the next one.